GLC presents Brought to you by the donations of our faithful partners And shalom. Welcome once again to a program from Millennium Communications. I'm Avi Ben Mordechai. We're going to be talking about Galatians today. It's an introduction to Galatians. Of course, Galatians, the letter that Paul wrote to the people of the same name, uh, is one of those letters that seems to have uh, a great deal of, uh, uh, of issue. Uh, perhaps I could call it the Magna Carta of the Christian faith. Well, let's take a look at Galatians on today's program, just merely an introduction to understand the basis of why Paul writes what he writes in that book. And I can assure you, I think it's going to be a little bit different than what you perhaps have been used to hearing about in uh, times past. Now, before we uh, get started into our program, let me remind you uh, that uh, we have the Galatians commentary, 478 pages of material right here, okay? This is the Galatians commentary that you can purchase from Millennium 7000 Communications or the Galatians Small Pocket Edition commentary. And also we have a CD and a DVD, a six-hour DVD teaching, which you can also ask for. So ask for the six-hour DVD or ask for the small pocket commentary, or if you are more inclined to do reading, particularly nighttime reading by your bed, go ahead and try the big, gigantic book, and don't feel intimidated with 478 pages. It's more of a reference work, but it should be able to help answer some of your questions in regards to Paul's commentary and letter to the Galatians. So with that, let's get started here, and we're going to take a look at our first slide here. This is dealing with two passages, Galatians 1, 13 through 14, and Acts chapter 22, verse 3. Let's take a look. In Galatians 1, 13 through 14, we learn the following. For you have heard of my former manner of life in Judaism. Okay, now when Paul says Judaism, it simply means the ism of Judah, the ism of Judah, of the house of Judah, or the house of Yehuda, especially as it's referenced in the book of Jeremiah, the prophet Jeremiah, chapter 3. Okay, so when Paul says Judaism, it is simply the ism of Judah. Now, what is the ism of Judah? We'll get back to that very soon here. Let's continue on. It's the Judaism, how I used to persecute the Kehilat, Elohim, or the congregation, or the church of Elohim, the church of God, beyond measure, he says, and tried to destroy it. And I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries among my brothers, being more extremely zealous for my ancestral traditions. What exactly are these ancestral traditions that Paul is referring to? Well, if you go to Acts chapter 22, verse 3, Shaul, or Paul, Shaul in Hebrew, Paul says, I am a Yehudi, I am a Jew. He says he was born in Tarsus of Cilicia, and he was brought up in this city, of course referring to Jerusalem, educated under Gamaliel, or as some say, Gamaliel, okay, Gamaliel, strictly according to the law of our fathers, being zealous for Elohim, just as you are all today here. So in Shaul, or Paul referencing this aspect of his education, the fact that he is studied and educated under Gamaliel, one of the greatest rabbinic minds of Paul's day. Gamaliel is actually senior and junior, father and son, and they are both mentioned in Jewish source doctrine called the Talmud. The Talmud, okay, and Gamlael, senior and junior, are both mentioned, again, in the Talmud. So here we have Gamlael, and Paul's teacher was Gamlael, and therefore being the fact that he was uh, studied under this man, this, uh, of course, explains the whole idea of why Paul says that he was more extremely zealous for my ancestral traditions. This is not referring to Mosaic Torah contract or Mosaic Torah covenant. 
what you might know to be the Ten Commandments or the 613 laws, things like that. No, this is strictly rabbinic oral law as what we understand, and I'm going to explain this to you shortly. Now let's go to the next slide here and pick up both passages from Galatians 1.14 and Acts 22, verse 3. Now again, Galatians 1.14, And I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries, and among my brethren being more extremely zealous for my ancestral traditions. Again, Acts 22, 3, that he was educated under Gamaliel. And the concept is strictly according to the law of our fathers. And the law of our fathers is nothing short of what uh, Paul would have understood or what we even understand today as rabbinic Jewish oral law. What is oral law? I'll explain it to you momentarily. Now let's go to our next slide because I want to reference here 1 Corinthians chapter 11 verses 1 through 2. Notice in 1 Corinthians 11, 1 through 2, uh, Paul is uh, making a, a very interesting statement and he says, be imitators of me just as I also am of Messiah. Fascinating concept that he brings out here. Be imitators of me. He wants us to imitate him. Why? Because he says he is imitating Messiah. This is very good because it should give you an indication of what to understand from 1 John 2, 6. Write it down. Please, pick up your Bible. You need to bring a Bible to these programs. Don't come to these programs without a Bible. Please, you need to study your, your texts, okay? 1 John 2, 6 talks about Messiah and that if you want to be like him, then you should walk as he walked. And Paul is saying very, very much a similar thing. Walk like Yeshua walked. Well, how exactly did Yeshua walk? Very simply, he walked according to Mosaic written contract, and that's what he taught. He taught the law of Moses, and we've learned that on our previous series in defining biblical terms. And if you don't recall that teaching or you would like to review that, contact us and we can get you a copy of the, uh, of the nine-part series that we did on defining biblical terms. So Paul, Shaul, in Hebraic thought, is here telling us just like, the, uh, God, like uh, 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 John, Yohanan, did in 1 John 2.6. Paul is saying very similar thing in 1 Corinthians 11, 1 through 2. Be imitators of me just as I am also of Messiah. So the question we need to ask is, what exactly did Messiah teach so that we can understand what it is that Paul is saying? After all, he's telling us, be imitators of him just as he is of Messiah. So if he's imitating Messiah, it is clear. We need to know, what did Messiah teach? All right, let's go to a few passages to understand the concept. First, Matthew 5, 19 through 20. Matthew 5, 19 through 20. Let's take a look here. Yeshua says, Whoever then annuls one of the least of these commandments and so teaches others shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever keeps and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. And then Yeshua goes on to say, For I say to you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. So what exactly is he saying here? This is a very clear statement that Yeshua is telling you, telling us, telling all of us, that in, if we want to have righteousness that surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, and that's the only way to get into the kingdom of heaven, then we must follow his teachings. And his teachings are, in fact, written Torah law. So when we say, or I should say, when the Messiah says, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you won't enter the kingdom of heaven, you would have to make very, very sure that you are surpassing the religion of the scribes and Pharisees. So how? Do you surpass the religion, the activity, the functions, the things that the scribes and Pharisees were teaching? How do you surpass that? Very simple. 
you have to be better than them. How do you do that? By following written Torah law, by following Mosaic instruction, by being involved with the covenant that Moses gave on Mount Sinai when he gave it to all Israel. That's the answer. So that means the Pharisees and scribes, according to many passages in the Brit HaDashah, in the New Testament, many passages like in John 5, John chapter 8, John chapter 12, Matthew chapter 15, Matthew chapter 23, there's plenty of passages that tell us that the scribes and Pharisees were not, I repeat, were not following written Torah law, written Mosaic contract, rather the Pharisees were doing tradition. Lots of it. Lots and lots and lots and lots of it. So, that's how you surpass them. Don't do their traditions. Let's go to our next slide and take a look at Luke 11:27 through 28. Now, Yeshua here says something very, very interesting. He says, it came about while he said these things. One of the women in the crowd raised her voice and said to him, Blessed is the womb that bore you, and the breasts at which you nursed. And what did Yeshua say? On the contrary, blessed are those who hear the word of Elohim, the word of God, and do. What does this reference? Hear and do is the concept. Hear and do. Remember that. It's a very interesting phrase that shows up over and over and over again in the texts of the New Testament. Hear and do. Hear and do. Hear and do. I have to repeat it because this is a phrase that is quite Hebraic. I must say, quite Hebraic. Hear and do. The word hear is shama in Hebrew. That's the what we call the third person masculine singular. It's the, the base text, okay? Shama. Also, do is asa, okay? So it's shama and asa. Now watch what happens here in our text. We're going to bring up Exodus chapter 24, verse 7. Then he, referring to Moses, took the book of the covenant and read it in the hearing of the people. And they said, all that yud heh has spoken, we will do and we will hear. Oh, this is really fascinating. We will do and we will hear. In other words, Yeshua is saying in Luke 11, 27 through 28, exactly what Moses was saying when he was giving the contract of his of the divine law to all B'nai Israel, to the children of Israel. And the children of Israel, with one voice, raised their, their minds and their hearts, and they said before the All-Eternal One, Na'aseh v'nishma. In other words, all that yud heh vav -Hey has spoken, we will do and we will hear. So how, here we have do and hear, do and hear, exactly what Yeshua was speaking about. Therefore, he was saying, you are blessed if you will hear and do, which is an exact understanding of Deuteronomy chapters 28 and following, chapter 28 and the blessings and the curses all found in the Mosaic Law. This is something we should really seriously consider. One more thing let's take a look at from the book of John, or Yohanan, Yohanan chapter 7, verses 14 through 19. Now here is an interesting phrase. Yeshua is getting into a, a little bit of a tiff, an argument, a discussion perhaps. Let's call it a academic rabbinic discussion with the religious leaders of his day. And he says, okay, well, the, the Jews actually, the Yehudim, the religious Jews. When it says the Jews, it means the religious Jews. And it says <clears throat> that when they uh, uh, were, were listening to him, they were marveling amongst themselves. And they were saying, how has this man become learned, that is, knowledgeable, having never been educated? That is, never been taught or studied in tradition. You see, this is something you have to understand about the term learned and educated. Learned in Hebrew is, is based on this principle from Psalm 119, verses 79 and 80. Psalm 119, verses 79 and 80. This is the concept of learned or yodea in Hebrew.
And then the term educated can be understood from Isaiah 29, 11 through 13. Again, Isaiah 29, 11 through 13, which is also understood from Acts, the book of Acts, chapter 22, verse 3. So here we have Yodea and we have the concept of lomed, or learning, okay, which is really education. In Hebraic thought, Learned means that of understanding written scripture, and educated is that of understanding not written scripture, but doing traditional man-made religion, man-made religion. So Yeshua then says in this, in this context, he says, my teaching is not mine, but his who sent me. If any man is willing to do his will, he'll know of the teaching, whether it is of Elohim or whether I speak for myself. He who speaks from himself seeks his own glory, but he who is seeking the glory of the one who sent him, he is true. And there is no unrighteousness in him. And then Yeshua says quite boldly, did not Moses give you the law? And yet none of you carries out the law, speaking to the religious Pharisees and scribes of his day. That may come as quite a surprise to some of you, but please understand that when Yeshua is speaking this so very boldly. He's saying, in effect, you don't do the Mosaic contract. You are very, very much keeping something other than the Mosaic contract. You are in mutiny against heaven. And this is why he says, why do you seek to kill me? Because from their perspective, they want to kill Yeshua because he is teaching something other than the law. And this comes into practice and play with what we understand to this very day about why we misunderstand the book of Galatians. Let's continue on with our study. Let's go to John 5, 43 through 47. Yohanan 5, 43 through 47. Yeshua says, I have come in my Father's name, and you don't receive me. Now, if another will come in his own name, you will receive him. How do you believe when you receive glory one from another and you do not seek the glory that is from the one and only God or one and only Elohim? How do you understand this? Do you, and then he says, do not think that I will accuse you before the Father. He says, the one who accuses you is Moshe, Moses, in whom you have set your hope. For if you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote of me. But if you do not believe, meaning trust, accept, or have faith in Moses and his writings, how will you believe my words? This is a very, very strong statement. In other words, let's put this into our own context today. If you do not accept Moses' words as valid and binding for everyday living and lifestyle today, if you don't, then you are not believing and having faith in Yeshua's teachings. You're not. On the contrary, if you accept the teachings of Moshe, Moses, the Ten Commandments, and you listen and obey them, you are, in fact, then believing in the words of Yeshua. And this is a very clear statement of this kind of thing. So let's understand that in rabbinic Judaism, in rabbinic Judaism, it's very, very important for you to understand that all of Judaism is based upon the quotation of previous sages and rabbis. We don't say in Judaism, in the name of Yudhevavi, in the name of the God of Israel. No, no, or in the name of the prophets. No, no, we don't do that, okay? I lived this for many years. I speak this truth to you so that you understand where we're coming from as Jews. In reality, in Judaism, when we study, we always quote the names of the famous rabbis and sages of previous generations. That's what I was bringing up here on the screen with you by quoting to you from the Talmud. We always say things like, well, we always say things like, said in the name of. This person said in the name of that person. This person, rabbi, said in the name of that rabbi, etc., etc. It's always in the name of a previous rabbi. Okay? Let's continue on here and talk about one more issue. This comes from Matthew 16, 5 through 11. Matthew 16, 5 through 11. The disciples came to the other side and had forgotten to take bread. And Yeshua said to them, watch out, beware of the leaven. 
the Hebrew concept here in the Hebrew Matthew would be that of seor. Seor is a Hebrew word that sounds like sour. You recognize that? Seor, sour. Watch out and beware of the seor of the Pharisees and Sadducees. He says, how is it you don't understand that I did not speak to you concerning bread? Beware of the seor of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Then they understood that he did not say to them, beware of the leaven of bread, but of the teaching of the Pharisees and Sadducees. What exactly is seor? Very simply. Those of you ladies who maybe you have grandmothers, and maybe you yourself have made sourdough bread. Well, in ancient days, you didn't go to the store and buy a packet of yeast. What do you do? You make seor, you make sourdough by taking dough, mixing it with a little water and then sugar or honey or something to give it that, that, that push, put it into a warm place and it grows and infects itself. Therefore, that makes the sourdough starter. From there, you take that and move it into another lump of fresh dough, and therefore, it infects that dough. The key word here is infect, like a bacteria. It's infecting. And so, seor is the concept of infecting something from a, uh, from a starter, a sourdough starter. So, Yeshua is saying, don't listen to the teaching of the Pharisees and Sadducees because they are like a sourdough starter. That they are taken, their, their, their teaching is put into the lump of bread called Torah, called Mosaic Written Law. And by putting it into the Mosaic Written Law, the Torah, you have an infection of the teaching, the divine teaching. Infecting it with what? With man-made religion, man-made traditions. That's what it's all about. Let's go to our next slide, Mark 7, 5 through 13. The Pharisees and scribes asked Yeshua, why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders? They eat their bread with impure hands. Then Yeshua said to them, rightly, did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites? Not certainly a nice thing to say, but he said it. You hypocrites. Then he quotes Isaiah 29, verse 13. And he says, you neglect the commandment of Elohim, holding to the tradition of men. And then at the end of the statement, he says, and you do a lot of things like that. This is the point. He is saying that the, the, whole, the whole concept of man-made tradition, of man-made law, is very, very focused in that this is tradition. And this kind of man-made tradition and church ecclesiastical law or rabbinic Judaism, the ism of Judah, all of that is in mutiny against the divine written instructions that Moses passed down for all Israel. And if you want to be a part of Israel, you must follow written instruction and not succumb yourself to man-made rules, regulations, traditions, things that go contrary to Scripture. But I'm very speci uh, specific about that because there are some traditions in life that are good. I mean, you get up in the morning and eat breakfast. That's a tradition, okay? There's lots of traditions that we do that are not a problem. The problem is when the traditions that we do are in direct violation or contra contradict written Mosaic Scripture. Let's now go over here to talk about Paul and discuss this idea, what about Paul? Well, the slide we're on here now will give you uh, five things. Uh, Paul, in 1 Timothy 1, 8 through 11, he calls the law of Moses sound teaching. Then in 2 Timothy 3, 15 through 16, he says the law, the prophets, and the writings are called wisdom. And that's based on Deuteronomy 4, verse 6. In Acts 24, verse 14, he calls the law and the prophets authoritative. Very interesting. In 1 Corinthians 14, 21 and Romans 16, 26, he is identifying the words of the prophets as scripture and law. Don't forget that. And in Romans 3.31, Paul Shaul says the Mosaic law is a good established teaching. I think we need to pay attention to what Shaul is saying, because he's saying nothing short of what Yeshua said in the Brita Hadashah.
And so this is going to bring us to the next program as we get into this, okay? And this is talking about what the rabbis taught. The rabbis taught in the Talmud, which is a, a literature that came out much later than Yeshua. But it says the following, because it was all oral at that time. The Talmud was orally transmitted up until about the year 160 to 200. But in the days of Yeshua and Paul, it was still transmitted by mouth, with the teacher to the student, the rabbi to the student, the father to the son. Our rabbis taught, a certain heathen once came before Shammai and asked him, how many Torot have you? Two, he says, the written and the oral Torah. Written is called Torah Shebektav, or written Torah. Oral Torah is called Torah Shebaopeh. That is by the mouth, okay? Now, Paul happens to understand this concept, and there's four different ways of saying law in Paul's vernacular. The word in Greek, of course, is nomos. But notice he says in Romans 7, 22 through 24, I delight in the law of Elohim. That's written scripture after the inward man. But I see another law on my members, another nomos. That's oral law. Warring against the law of my mind. That's written scripture. And bringing me into captivity to the law of sin. And of course, death. That's oral law. That's oral Torah. That's man-made law, which is in my members. He brings nomos into different concepts into different categories, yet it's the same word. We're going to come back on the next program and finish up our discussion on this. Please join us and we'll talk more about it. Pick up the book Galatians or the DVD and you can learn more about this. I want to thank you for being a part of our program today and remember that Galatians, though seriously misunderstood, can be properly understood by looking at man-made oral law versus divine written instruction in the Jewish literature called Torah. Have a great day. Thanks for joining us. I'm Avi Ben Mordechai. I'm Avi Ben Mordechai, and I want to thank you so much for tuning into our program today here on GLC. This has been the program Defining Biblical Terms. And keep in mind that everything we're talking about today is very important and it is free. Yes, indeed. The program itself, the material is free, but the conduit is not. It costs a lot of money to bring these programs. Keep this in mind, be considerate of this, don't just sit there and take the programs in and say, okay, and somebody else will pay for it. Please write a check. Help this ministry here at GLC bringing these programs to you, okay, so that we can continue to bring these to you on a regular basis. Shalom, and thanks for watching. program was produced by and for God's Learning Channel. If you enjoy this program, we need your support to keep this program on GLC. Please make your checks out to God's Learning Channel, P.O. Box 61000, Midland, Texas 79711-1000. Please be sure to designate where your contribution is intended. It is very important to let GLC know which programs you enjoy and support.